a beautiful talk. And uh, now we'll have a presentation by Pedro Viera, who uh, uh, obtained his undergraduate degree in Porto, in Portugal, and then continued his uh, graduate work in Paris, in Ecole Normale Supérieure, and uh, in Porto. He was then a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute in Potsdam in Germany. And then he, was, he moved to Perimeter Institute in Canada, where very quickly he was promoted to a professor, where he is now. And simultaneously, he carries a, a faculty professorial appointment at the International Center for Theoretical Physics, ICTP, South American Institute for Fundamental Research in Brazil. Pedro was an Alfred Sloan Fellow in 2015, and he received the, the Gribov Medal, again, a very important distinction in 2015. Pedro is an outstanding young theoretical physicist who has made highly innovative and influential contributions to quantum field theory. His quest to develop new non-perturbative approaches to understanding strongly coupled quantum field theories has already led to several breakthroughs, and he is clearly poised for much more. His work exemplifies the highest traditions of scientific creativity and leadership. The point is that all of you uh, know that the, the Onzaga solution of two-dimensional Ising model was really a watershed moment in the history of theoretical physics. Uh, to the extent that Landau said that he was astonished by this. Um, in three dimensions, people have tried to obtain exact solutions of Ising models so far unsuccessfully. And that's why it was such a great shock when it turned out, to a great degree, thanks to the work of Pedro and his collaborators, that in four dimensions there are consistent quantum field theories where you can obtain exact results, exact non-perturbative results. This is astonishing and to this day. I think we do not fully understand What's the trick? Why is it possible? And which theories will allow it in future? But uh, Pedro is at the absolute forefront of this activity. That's why he was awarded this prize. And let me just mention uh, a few results which are really shockingly beautiful and important. So when he was still a graduate student with his advisor, uh, Kazakov in Paris, they obtained, and another colleague, they obtained the first ever exact results uh, for so-called anomalous dimensions in a strongly coupled field theory. Anomalous dimensions are basically the same thing as critical exponents in statistical mechanics. So imagine you have a four-dimensional, fully-fledged, relativistic, strongly coupled quantum field theory, and someone computes the critical exponents exactly. This was a great shock that this can be done. And he only, the trajectory only accelerated from there on. Uh, after computing exactly the anomalous dimensions or critical exponent in 2009, together with Basso and Sever, they computed, they provided the first non perturbative formulation of amplitudes, not just the critical exponents, but the, actually the correlation functions. And uh, 2015, higher order correlation functions. And most recently, uh, Pedro has been at the forefront of asking the question, what is the space of all consistent quantum field theories? What are the bounds that must be satisfied by the couplings and spectra of these theories so that they are consistent? So with this set of achievements, it's clear why he was selected. And it's an enormous pleasure to have Pedro here. And Please. 
I'm probably okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here and very honored by the award. So I'll be telling you about indeed some developments that uh, have happened over the years in trying to understand this uh, supersymmetric quantum field theory, which is called N equals 4 super young Mills. And as you will see, my, as I will try to convey, we did learn some things about general things about string theory and about this idea of the usefulness of cutting strings into small pieces so that these small pieces are simple enough that we can study them. So the basic message is drawn here with these scissors is the idea that a string is a two-dimensional material like a piece of, of tissue and you cut it so that it's simple enough that you can study it. Now, of course, what we would love to is to know about, is to study, say, the strong force. So I would love to be able to give a talk about pure blue, so that would be the top mountain in this space of quantum field theories. Right? So learning about the strong force would be formidable, as Zohar was mentioning. And they have this picture of the strong force of the gluons holding the quarks together. And most of our mass comes from gluons. And precisely because the force is so strong, it's also so hard to compute with. Now there is a cousin of the theory of pure glue, which is this so-called Darth Vader theory, or N equals for super young Mills. So it was Neymar Kanye Ahmed that dubbed it the Darth Vader theory. So I'm going to use Darth Vader for indicating N equals 4. Which is, okay, it's a little bit smaller than pure glue. It's not as important as pure glue. I tried very hard yesterday to look for a picture where the next to the smallest mountain was more symmetric than the largest one. So I Google imaged landscape with mountains where the next to the last is more symmetric than the biggest one and so on. But it was not that easy to find. So this is the best I could find. So that second mountain there represents this supersymmetric young mills theory, which is a very symmetric theory in four dimensions. It contains gluons, but it also contains a bunch of other particles, a bunch of scalars and fermions. And it's a very symmetric theory that was, as was mentioned in the introduction, some people think of it a little bit as the Ising model of field theories in the sense that it's simple enough that we might expect to be able to say something about it but rich enough that it has a strong coupling limit and so on that we might be able to draw general lessons about field theory. Now, large N gauge theories are string theories. Both, this is true, both of large N pure glue and of large N N equals 4 super young mills. So suppose you have, say, a quark and an antiquark that are traveling in time. This would be the green, the green lines. And they exchange a gluon which would be this pink line being exchanged between them. Gluons are the carriers of the strong force. So we have the quark and the antiquark, and they throw a gluon at each other, or many, many gluons. And as they throw more and more gluons at each other, you see that the picture you start drawing is like a discretization of this two-dimensional surface. And what happens is that when the number of colors of your gluons is very large, it is these surfaces without holes that dominate. So you throw very various gluons at each other and you end up drawing a two-dimensional surface. And that's how the theory organizes itself. We have a surface without any holes, plus a small correction times a surface with one hole, plus a small correction with a surface with two holes, and so on. So the message of just this simple diagrammatic expansion that Tooft introduced was that if we are powerful enough, if we are capable enough, we should be able to translate computations in four dimensions, where we have the quark moving in four dimensions, the other anti-quark moving in four dimensions, the exchange of gluon in four dimensions, everything is four dimensional. But they draw this two-dimensional surface. So if we are smart enough, we should be able to trade the dynamics in four dimensions by the dynamics of this two-dimensional string. Now, this might be very challenging, and the point is that in some theories we can make it precise. Now, let me here mention a small puzzle and its immediate solution, which is that if you think here, down here, of your quark and anti-quark, and you think that they have this string, this blue string, which is the, the string that I described before, that would be like the flux tube between the quark and the anti-quark. Now, at the same time, if our theory is not confining, we imagine Faraday lines not as a thick flux tube between the two, but as some spread out lines like drawn there. 
All right, so on the one hand, the flux lines there don't resemble at all a string. They are spread out, they open up and then they close. On the other hand, we have this picture of tooth that we were describing where it should be a thin surface that we are discretizing. And of course, both are compatible and the point is that it is indeed a string, it is indeed a thin string, but it goes into an extra dimension. No one said from the previous argument that this string needed to live in the same space-time dimensions as the quarks do. So this string goes into an extra dimension and then comes back to our space-time and what we see is like a shadow of this string and that's why these Faraday lines are thick and that's why they are not thin. Okay? So, <clears throat> now this string is not a classical string. We sum over all exchanges of gluon. The gluon can go directly, it can bend. We sum over everything in quantum mechanics. And similarly, this surface vibrates. So similarly, we sum over all possible string surfaces. And it so happens that if, the, that if the tension of this string, if the effective tension of this string is large, then indeed we sum over classical string solutions. Because the string tension is very large and the strings become classical. The string tension is small, they fluctuate a lot. So then the point is that these string theories, they are kind of easy in two regimes. When the string tension is very large, because then it's just about classical string solutions. In other words, it's about soap, soap film surfaces, it's about minimal area surfaces. Uh, or when the coupling is very small, because then we just exchange one gluon between the quark and the antiquark, or maybe two gluons and so on. Now, while it is true that gauge theories should be string theories, it doesn't mean that it's easy to identify which string theory it is, what's the precise rules of this string theory, and how to compute efficiently with this two-dimensional string theory. So this is something we do know very well in N equals 4 superior meals. What is the string theory? It's called super string theory in a 10-dimensional space-time, which is an hyperboloid in five dimensions and the sphere in five dimensions. But what is the string theory that describes pure glue? We don't know. We don't know the precise details of this theory. And as I said, uh, in this hyperbolic space, sometimes the surfaces that we sum over, when the string tension is large, the, string, the, the tension is very large, so the string becomes classical. And, uh, and therefore, you should think that the kind of string solutions are like some minimal area surfaces that go from ADS into the bulk of ADS. Now, so we have this beautiful duality where now I split Darth Vader into two because Darth Vader can be a gauge theory or a string theory. So actually we are talking about two theories at once. So we kill two birds with one stone. So here we can have a description in terms of gluons or a description in terms of strings. So when the coupling is very weak, it's clear that the gluon description is very convenient. You have your quark and your antiquark, and they throw one gluon at each other, and that's a very good approximation. When the coupling is very large, it's clear that the string picture is much cleaner. You have a string, a classical string, stretched between the quark and the antiquark. But what about in between? And more precisely, how do gluons become strings? How do the degrees of freedom reorganize themselves? How do you start with gluons, these four-dimensional objects which have plus elicity and minus elicity, and suddenly you have strings. How do the two things talk to each other? How does one become another? So just so that we become a little bit concrete, let me mention here a very concrete puzzle, for example. Here are the flux tube excitations of the chromodynamic flux tube of N equals 4 super young mills. So in this theory, we can compute a lot, as I'm going to explain, and we can compute the mass spectrum of the flux tube excitations of this theory. So you imagine you have your chromodynamic flux tube and you hit it and you excite it and you measure the energy of these excitations. And you get this plot here. So you have some gluonic excitations, so the red line, that start at 1 and go to square root of 2. You have a fermionic excitation whose mass is always 1, all the way from weak coupling to strong coupling. And you have some scalar excitations, these six scalars, that start at one as well, and then they become very light. What you see here in this toy example is a little bit of this example of grand unification that Zohar was mentioning. The lines, they are all the same at weak coupling, because we have supersymmetry. And then as we turn on the coupling, we are turning on this, this flux tube. It's a little bit like the lightsaber of Darth Vader. He turns on 
and it's full of gluons. And therefore, because it's full of gluons, it's breaking supersymmetry. Gluons are the important constituents of this flux tube. And then the mass of these particles are no longer the same. These particles are no longer all rotated by supersymmetry, and therefore their masses change. There is some remnant of supersymmetry. For example, the fact that the fermion has mass 1 is precisely because the fermion knows that supersymmetry was broken and it becomes a Goldstein at zero momentum. But otherwise, we have these particles, the gluons of mass square root of 2, the fermions of mass 1, and the scalars, which are very light, and let's ignore the scalars for now. Now, and this is the result of the spectrum. Now, at the same time, what do we expect from this holographic picture? At strong coupling, we have a string. A string is a piece of string, and it can vibrate. Can vi imagine you have a piece of string here. It can vibrate in this direction or this direction. So there are two modes of vibration of the string. Right? I stretch a string, and it vibrates here or here. But in ADS, it's five dimensions, so we have one more direction. So we have three modes. We have this, we have this, and we have another one that I cannot represent here. Okay? <clears throat> and if you study the geometry of EDS, this all follows from geometry, you see that you have two of these modes, they have mass square root of 2, and one has mass equal to 2. And it's quite nice, because the ones that have mass square root of 2, it's perfect, because we have two excitations, the gluon excitations of the chromodynamic flux tube, that have mass that goes to square root of 2. But that's not enough. Not only gluons need to become strings, but this extra holographic direction needs to emerge. And if you look at the picture here, there's no one with mass 2. Here's an example of a puzzle. Where is this mass 2 coming from? If you see, I mean, there's no one, and we need the mass 2. We need three modes if we want to describe a five-dimensional space. Okay, so I'll come back to this point in a bit. Now, strings, so this second part of Darth Vader, are a bit simpler than gluons in four dimensions, than four-dimensional physics, simply because strings are two-dimensional objects. Or if you want, they are one-dimensional objects that move in time. So here on the right, you have a string with three bumps. You have a bump here, a bump here, and a bump here. So it's like water waves, and you, scatter, and you send these waves against each other, and they can scatter in a point here. So this would be these waves evolve, and they meet at some point in space-time. There is a picture that you can think also in the gauge theory. This is what's called a non-abelian gauge theory. Non-abelian because things don't commute. And indeed, you have a, your fields in your theory, and if you multiply them, they don't commute, so they define a one-dimensional structure. You have one guy times another, times another, times another, times another, and they define a one-dimensional structure. And you can also think that in this one-dimensional structure, the, your excitations, your fields can move, and they can scatter with each other. So this is what happens in two dimensions, because in two dimensions, the world is one-dimensional plus time, when you send things, they always scatter with each other. There's no way out. You cannot just avoid each other. You always scatter. And in two dimensions, there are special theories where when things scatter, it's as if they scatter in a sequence of first these two guys scatter, then these two, and then these two. And when this happens, the theory is called integrable. It's a theory where to study what happens with many, many particles, you just need to know what happens when two particles meet. Because if you know what happens when two particles meet, when n particles meet, they just meet two at a time. Okay? And it so turns out that n equals 4 super young meals, it's a very symmetric theory, theory, and perhaps the most powerful of these symmetries is exactly this integrability symmetry. It's a symmetry that says that the excitations of its chromodynamic flux tube, when they interact with each other, they, they do so in a pairwise way. Now, just because things are two-dimensional, it doesn't mean they are trivial, because you can still have very rich topologies. The simplest of which is the so-called cylinder. You have a closed string, and the closed string evolves in time. And as it's evolving in time, it's drawing a cylinder, it's drawing a tube. That's simple enough. That's what we would say it's a standard two-dimensional quantum field theory in finite volume, because the string is finite. But that's standard. So as physicists, what we learn in in school is how do I compute energy of, of systems that I put in some, in some circle, in some finite volume, and I want to compute its energy levels. So that's studying quantum field theory in a standard topology. But then we have much richer topologies. If I want to study a string splitting into two, this would be a pair of pants. I could study two strings that split and they make a hole in space-time, this handle, and this would be related to studying 
N equals four super young meals in what's called a non-planar regime. Exactly this regime where you start having holes in your surface. Or it could be related to a string that ends in ADS and goes inside and goes back to ADS and this would be related to an open string that stretches from here, goes around and goes here. And these guys would be related to scattering amplitudes and they will be the main focus of what I'm going to tell today. Now the spectrum, precisely because the theory is integrable, was solved already in 2009, as was mentioned in the introduction. And there is kind of a well-known recipe that you can follow. You can open a book. Okay? If you know Russian, it helps. Most of these books are in Russian. So you open a Russian book. How do I solve the spectrum of an integrable theory? And there is a recipe. So the key ingredient is the S matrix, as I said. So particles scatter in a factorized way. So what's really important for you to know is how two particles scatter. If you know, then you know how any number of particles scatter. And then if you know how particles scatter, you can put them in a circle, and you can start quantizing the momenta of these excitations in the circle, because you take a particle, it goes around the circle. As it goes around the circle, it meets each of the other ones in a pairwise way, because the theory is integrable. So you can compute the total phase acquired by the particle, impose that it's trivial, in this way quantize the momenta, and then correct it, because this is not a perfect picture, because you also have virtual particles going around and so on, that you take into account, resum all these virtual particles, and in the end of the day, you end up with this beautiful quantum spectral curve, which uh, is a mathematical resummation of all this physical picture of excitation, scattering, and so on. But its final mathematical incarnation is actually totally... Uh, uh, it's hard to recognize any of these physics, but there is a beautiful mathematical structure that I can't avoid mentioning, which is that the final solution to the spectrum of n equals 4 super young meals is a little bit like a palace, like a beautiful palace full of very nice rooms. So the way it works is that there is a Riemann-Hilbert problem, which is a problem that tells you when you are in a Riemann surface, which is exactly like this palace with many rooms, and you go inside a cut of this Riemann surface, you go from one sheet to another sheet, like when you have a square root and you cross the square root and you go to the other sheet. And it tells you what happens. What are the monodromies when you precisely enter the various sheets? And there are infinitely many sheets. And you go inside this, you cross several rooms and so on, and sometimes you enter some rooms that they call the magical sheets. Okay? And you go inside these last rooms, and these last rooms are special rooms where you enter through one of these square root cuts. You enter there, and you look around, and you see no more cuts. There's an entrance door, and there are no more doors. If you want, you, you can go again inside the same door you came from. But that's it. And in these special sheets, because there are no more cuts, the only thing you can do is you go to infinity. And there, as you go to infinity, you see how things decay. And the way things decay is what tells what the energy of your various states are. It's really a very beautiful structure of this mathematical structure of this infinitely sheeted problem. And this allows people right now to draw plots for dimensions of operators of things that would be totally unthinkable a few, a few years ago, like computing what's the energy, the imaginary and real part of the critical exponents, as you consider complex spin, not even discrete spin. You take some operators, which can have spin 2, spin 4, spin 6. You analytically continue it to complex spin. You find some beautiful structures with cuts and so on. You can draw things like this. You can deform n equals 4 and add to it twists to consider some non-unitary theory and then follow the critical exponents as you vary these twists. There is really almost no limit to what you can do with concerning the spectrum. Now, as I said before, with hindsight, it has to work in a sense because the spectrum is co about computing what are the energy levels of known integrable theories, and there is a well-known procedure. It's, it doesn't mean it's trivial because this theory is richer than an average integrable theory. It's a theory where uh, it's, it's not exactly a spin chain, it's not exactly a relativistic theory, it's something in between, so you need to redevelop many of the tools. But more or less, it's about computing the spectrum in finite volume, so it kind of had to work. Now, as we go to these other quantities, scattering amplitudes and so on, we might be a little bit more worried, because now we are dealing with integrable theory on spaces of various topologies, and much less is known about those cases. Now, of course, you can say the reason for all these miracles was about this factorization, was about you take three bumps of energy and they scatter, 
and they interact in a pairwise way. But that's, a, that, that's about the tissue of the string. That's a special property of the tissue. This tissue, this material is such that when you scatter excitations, they factorize and they interact in a factorized way. Whether you take this tissue and make a cylinder out of it or a pair of pants, then it probably should not matter that much. It's the same material, the same miraculous material that's interact, that particles interact in a nice way is going to be used for building any quantity. So then you would expect that any observable should, you should be able to compute. So then with this, okay, let's, let's try to be more pragmatic and answer what can we do? Now, before, as I said, the key observable was the S matrix. And here I'm generalizing a little bit the S matrix in that I'm scattering not just two particles from the infinite past to the infinite future, but I'm putting a particle on the infinite right and also a particle on the infinite left. Okay? This generalized set of S matrices where you scatter particles not just from the infinite past to the infinite future, but also from the infinite right from the infinite left are well-defined observables because they are dealing with the asymptotic structure. And that's what's natural in a, in a theory of quantum gravity. In a theory of quantum gravity, where this surface is vibrating, it's not that natural to ask what's the correlation function between an operator here and an operator here, when space-time is changing and these positions are not well-defined concepts. I'm summing over all these vibrations of this surface. But what's natural is to consider asymptotic observables and scatter things. For example, for studying the Casimir energy, what you will scatter is a virtual particle that goes around. In that case, you would put one particle in green, like drawn here. And if you compute the Casimir energy in the presence of two physical excitations, that's exactly the kind of process you would do. You send a virtual particle from the left, it goes from the right, and it goes around. Okay? So this was very natural. It was very natural that the key observable was this S matrix of the chromodynamic flux tube, because we are dealing with a theory of quantum gravity. <laughs> So what we can do, however, is consider what I'm calling here some creative patchwork, which is we also just touch infinity, but we change the asymptotic structure at infinity. We say instead of having a past, a future, a left and a right, let's imagine that our surface has, say, a past, a left, a right, and two futures. Okay? So this would be like a pentagon. So instead of going around and having four asymptotic regions, you would have five asymptotic regions. You would have to go around, not two pi, but five pi over two, in order to go back to the same position. So it's a little bit like inserting a conical excess, where you insert some, you would just say that your space time, instead of having angle two pi, now it has a little bit more angle. And these are very mild operators, they are a little bit non-local, they are called branch point twist field operators. They were introduced by Cardi and um, Castro Alvaredo and Dayon. And they precisely allow you to modify your theory by just changing the asymptotic structure at infinity. And they amount precisely for considering theories with patches which are not a square, but which can be a pentagon or an hexagon or any multi or any polygon you want. Okay? So how do you go about finding them? How do I compute expectation values? So it's a little bit like an S matrix, but now I send particles, say, from the past to the left future, or from the past to the right future. And how do I compute these probabilities of sending particles now for these various asymptotic regions? I bootstrap it. I ask, what kind of properties should this object have? So once I already know the S matrix, what kind of properties should this object have? And say, if I swap two particles, I should pay an S matrix. If I take a particle and do ma many weak rotations, the particle comes back to itself. I write a bunch of axioms that allow me to eventually solve and compute this pentagon and hexagons, which turn out to be the ones that we need, that we will use, to then glue stitch together to get any of these complicated topologies. Okay? So let me, in the remaining part of the talk, give uh, just a few details on how this goes about for this pentagon case. And in the afternoon, I'll give a more technical presentation or I'll explain uh, how this hexagon business goes. So here is an example on how we can use these objects for computing this scattering amplitude, scattering of blue ones. 
So it turns out that in this theory, the scattering of gluons is equal to the expectation value of a null polygonal Wilson loop. So let me explain what this is. So you remember before I had this picture of the quark and the anti-quark moving along two straight lines. Now imagine that they move along a polygon. So you have the quark that moves, turns, 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 until it goes back to the same position. And it moves in a sequence, it, it goes back to the same position, so it means that the sum of all the vectors where it moves is equal to zero. And let's suppose that it moves at the speed of light along each segment. It turns out that this is equal, this expectation value is equal to the scattering amplitude where I send particles with momenta k1, k2, k3, and so on. And of course, this moment add up to zero by momentum conservation. So we have a scattering amplitude process with momenta k1, k2, etc. It's equal to this quark propagation expectation value with path k1, k2, etc. that close because of momentum conservation. So the, 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 this duality is actually a consequence of string theory. It, it follows from T-duality of string theory, which is the symmetry of string theory. But it can also be proven in n equals 4 super young mills perturbatively, but I won't go into details. So if you want, forget about scattering amplitudes and think that we are studying this quark-anti-quark -quark propagation along null lines. And then how do we go about and study this quark-anti-quark -quark propagation that have this flux tube between the two? And the basic idea is, well, to evolve this flux tube in time, we know how to evolve it because we know the spectrum. And to deal with this complicated topology, to these complicated shapes, we will use like this quilt analogy where we will break this surface into pentagons and then each pentagon, we will uh, use the fact that we can bootstrap them, that we can find them exactly to study what this quantity is. Ah, okay. So I had, yeah, in Keynote, this would appear slowly and I would be able to explain slowly <laughs> the various steps, but now in PDF it appears all at once, so I'll have to, to make a bigger effort. So here is the bigger black polygon outside, and the basic idea for splitting it into polygons, uh, into pentagons, is as follows. You take this cusp here, and you draw a null line that hits this segment here. Then you take this point here and you draw a null line that hits this segment here. These lines are unique. If, it's, if this line is null, it hits this point at one point only. And then you continue in this way. And in this way you have a sequence of squares. This first square, this second square, this square, this square, this square. These are all squares in the sense that they are polygons with four edges and all edges are null. And now each two consecutive squares they make a pentagon. So you can think that I have the vacuum here, it gets a kick and therefore it goes into the state Psi 1, then it gets another kick and goes to state Psi 2, then Psi 3, and then it hits the vacuum again. And then we have these pentagon expectation values that mediate the transition between 1 and 2, between 2 and 3, between 3 and vacuum, and so on. These pentagon transitions that we bootstrap. And the relative orientation, which is by how much particles need to propagate as they move in this snake, would come in this Boltzmann weight that would encode the geometry of this polygon, in other ways, the momenta of the scattering amplitudes. Okay? So it's a little bit like these snakes. In Portugal, we have these snakes that you have these small pieces, and you can twist them around, and they also make some nice noise if you whistle here, that parents love. So, uh, so here it would be the same. You would have this snake, and this parameter, they control the geometry of this snake. Okay. And this again should have appeared slowly. Okay, now everything at the same time. So now let's go back to this puzzle that I said before. <clears throat> so first let me mention that at strong coupling, what do we expect? At strong coupling, the problem is purely geometrical. At strong coupling, remember, so we have this polygon, and all we have to do is compute the minimal area that ends on this polygon and goes inside ADS. It's purely geometrical, there is no... There it's just a mathematical problem. Compute the minimal area that ends on this polygon and stretches inside this hyperboloid. And we computed it a few years ago, and we found uh, that the area of this polygon was given by an expansion, an infinite expansion that resembled a partition function. Which now, of course, it's very natural because we had exactly this partition function of gluing together these pentagons and summing over everything that can flow. And what do we see there? Well, we see what we expect to see. We see two excitations of mass square root of 2. You see there is square root of 2 here 
and there are two terms, one with plus helicity, one with minus helicity, and one excitation of mass 2. That's exactly what we expect from just geometry of anti-sitter space. On the other hand, as I told you before, the spectrum contains two excitations of mass square root of 2 and no excitations of mass 2. So then we understood. We understood that as we are gluing together these pentagons and we are integrating over this, all these particles that can flow, there are these states where you have two fermions. And what happens is that these two fermions, their contribution, it wants to localize where the fermions bind together. So these fermions are forming a bound state, some kind of Cooper pair, and they are becoming a boson excitation of mass 1 plus 1. And 1 plus 1 is 2. And, one plus, and therefore, these are the missing excitations of mass 2. So what happens is that at finite coupling, they don't bind. They are virtual states. So there is no holographic direction. As you increase the coupling asymptotically, they are becoming asymptotically bound states, giving rise to a new bosonic excitation, which is a new holographic direction describing this missing fifth direction that, uh, with, with, that was missing before. And that's how we get this extra mode of mass square root of 2. Now, here it's 2 because it's 1 plus 1, and 1 is 1 because of supersymmetry. It's not broken, so it's just 1. And 1 plus 1 is 2. If you imagine now breaking symmetry of this, then this mass 1 would go to lambda QCD, and this would become some heavy excitation. And if you see the quantum numbers, it would be a pseudo-scalar, which would be some massive pseudo-scalar. And people are claiming recently that they want to add some massive pseudo-scalar to the QCD string to properly match lattice, so I wonder if it's more or less the same mechanism. It would be fun. So, so that's an example of where Having this exact solution at hand gave us some physical intuition that I think would have been hard to have guessed beforehand without this particular example, at least. I think you'd have to be very imaginative. Now, as I'm going to describe later in the afternoon, hexagons, not pentagons, can be useful to describe clo closed strings rather than open strings. So, for example, a pair of pants, you can cut it into two hexagons, the yellow and the green one, which is actually exactly how tailors make pair of pens. Your pair of pens are glued into two hexagons. And in the afternoon, I'm going to describe exactly how we can use this to build not only planar three and four point scattering amplitudes like drawn here, but non-planar ones. So as you see, there is an emergent picture emerging where to describe various topologies, the basic ingredient are these pentagons and hexagon patches that are simple enough that just with some simple axioms you can bootstrap them and then you glue them together. And you get that the result for all these funny quantities are given by infinite sums and integrals that come from patching together these objects and summing over everything that can flow between them. Now, it's not perfect. It's not perfect because even if you want to evaluate them at some finite coupling, you still have these infinite sums and integrals. It's complicated to stitch them back together. It's not at the same level of the spectrum where you have this beautiful quantum spectral curve and you can go to complex spin and plot these beautiful surfaces at finite coupling. We can't do anything like that for these other physical quantities, so perhaps there's more to be done. So, of course, we would love to connect these closed and open strings and understand how these hexagons relate to pentagons. We would like having these solutions at hand to study various beautiful properties such as bulk locality, how do we understand that as we take correlation functions, we start seeing that in the bulk some points localize, which would be an understanding this emergence of bulk locality from, as an emergent phenomena. We would like, again, to resum and have this beautiful quantum spectral curve mathematics backing up the physics that we think we understood. And now, as I'm going to explain in the afternoon, using these hexagons, we can even go beyond the planar limit, so it's very interesting to start trying to think what we can learn about string field theory and one of our annual estimations. And in a more speculative vein, we can see what could we have learned about this. So, there are at least two string theories we know very well, free string theory in a flat space and string theory in ADS5. It's another example where we more or less understand. In flat space, we are dealing with some free bosons and free fermions in two dimensions. I would say it could be a little bit too simple, perhaps, to indicate what could be the general framework for string theory. ADS5 is a little bit more complicated, and right now it seems like the only way we have to describe this string theory is by cutting it into the simpler patches and using them 
as the fundamental building blocks. So it raises the question whether it could be that these patches, these hexagonal patches or these pentagonal patches, could be a fundamental defining property of general string theories, and whether we can bootstrap some kind of hexagons that we could glue together to build scattering of glue balls, say. Okay. Thank you. So here, it's very important to distinguish two dimensions from higher dimensions. So when you have a string, it's a two-dimensional material, right? Now, you can take two tubes and scatter them, and they hit each other, and then they move, and then they split into more particles. So these tubes, this scattering in higher dimensional space of these tubes, you don't have just two, two, two scattering, and there's no factorization. So in higher dimensions, these closed strings, you scatter two strings and you can get three strings. All of that exists. But now, you look not at what's happening in space-time, but you look at the surface of these two-dimensional strings. There, you have ripples in these two-dimensional strings. Two-dimensional ripples moving on the string. And those, in this theory, because the theory is integrable, they scatter in a factorized way. So there are many models in two dimensions, and in two dimensions only, where the scattering is factorized. Uh, and the point is that we are exploiting this property of the two-dimensional surface to then learn about higher dimensional things which are not factorized and where you have all the multibody interactions and so on. It's the fact that we are exploring the, two dimen the, the inherent simplicity of two dimensions and of this integrable two-dimensional. 